Hello my friends, Hank here, and welcome back to Sherman School, the series where we're learning all about the iconic American M4 medium tank that served as the backbone of the Allied armor divisions during the Second World War. Now, in our last class, we chatted all about the back end of the old Sherman and some key clues to look out for on the engine decks of those tanks to help determine exactly what variant of the M4 we were looking at. But today, we're going to be covering all of the ins and outs of the M4 Sherman. Literally. Sherman School Part 5, Hull Hatches, coming right up. Alright, so if you guys are caught up on the Sherman School series so far, you'll know that we're working through my HEATS system for identifying Sherman tank variants. In our first four videos, we covered the H for hull and the E for engine or engine deck. If you haven't seen those videos yet, I would recommend starting from the top. There'll be a link down in the description below. Don't worry, I will be right here when you get back, but go watch those first. Today's session, though, is all about the A in HEATS, access. We're talking about hatches. In this video, I'm going to be referring to my trusty Sherman Spotters Guide and Sherman Data Sheet posters a bit. If you would like, you can grab yourself one over at spruceandbrews.com or in the shop just below this video. It's not required, but they can be handy to have for later reference. Now, the types of hatches employed on a Sherman usually can't tell us exactly what variant of the M4 we're looking at, but they can certainly tell us a lot. Your Sherman tank is always going to have either three or four main hatches for the crew. Two in the hull, and either one or two up in the turret. We're going to start by chatting about hull hatches in today's video. Every variant of the Sherman tank you're going to see will have two hull hatches. One for the driver, and one for the co-driver, or the assistant driver, or the hull gunner, whatever you want to call them. These are always going to be mirror images of each other. They butterfly open towards the outside of the tank. Now, within the world of Sherman hull hatches, we have two kinds, the small hatch and the large hatch. The small hatch comes first and will be employed on the earliest versions of all main Sherman types, the M4, the M4A1, the M4A2, the M4A3, and the M4A4. The small hatch itself is a narrow oval that runs parallel to the shape of the hull, like so. With early M4A1s, our cast hull Shermans, little blisters for our driver and co-driver are shaped right into that front plate, and those small hull hatches sit right on top of those. But for our welded hull variants, as we learned in our first episode, that front plate is affixed at a very steep 56 degree angle, meaning there literally isn't enough physical space inside the hull to fit our two crewmen where they need to be. So, on our early welded hull M4 variants, we're going to see what's called a driver's hood. This is a little cast or welded bulge that's mounted on top of our driver and co-driver positions, and our small hatch will be located on top of those hoods. The upper body, the head, the shoulders, and all that of our driver and co-driver will be nestled inside these hoods like so. That's their spot. On the very earliest M4 variants with small hatches, you're going to see what's called a direct vision port, or a DV port, in front of those hoods. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's a narrow little hole directly in front of the driver and the co-driver position that they would be able to look through to see where they're going. Small little armored shield that you can lower to close the port, and there you go. Now, as you might expect, it pretty quickly became apparent that having a literal hole in the armor right in front of your two crew members was a little bit of a vulnerability. By the midsummer of 1942, orders come down that the direct vision ports will be discontinued on all future Sherman production, and existing units featuring this port, as well as final units coming off the production lines with these, are going to start to simply weld those ports shut in a small attempt to shore up that portion of the armor. So, if you do see a Sherman with small hatches and these direct vision ports, you know that this is an oldie. Pre-summer 42 production, oftentimes you're going to hear these referred to as DV Shermans. In the back half of 42, all manufacturers start to make some tweaks to their hood design and forego the DV port entirely. The casting design of the M4A1 changes slightly to simplify those bumps in front of our small hatches, and all of the welded hull Shermans make their own changes as well. And this is where we can start to pick up some identification clues as to our specific variants of the M4. There are two kinds of hoods that you're going to see without that DV port. Cast hoods and welded hoods. Now, all of these are welded on to the tank itself, of course, but the hood itself is either made of a piece of cast steel or welded together using various bits of rolled steel. Now, key identification point here. If you see a clean-sided, welded box for a hood, like this one right here, this is a guaranteed M4A2 that you're looking at. The Fisher Tank Arsenal were the only ones that produced Shermans with these welded boxy hoods like this, and they were all M4A2s. So if you do see that, you know for certain you're looking at an M4A2. As for the cast hoods, there are two sub-variants within the cast design. There are narrow cast hoods and wide cast hoods. I know, stick with me here. 
Since these are cast components, they'll both have rounded edges, but the easiest way to tell them apart from any angle is to look for the weld lines. Narrow cast hoods were welded right onto the hull plate. The beads are right around the base of the hood itself. Wide hoods are incorporated into a larger cast panel of the hull. There are not going to be any weld beads right on the base of these, but instead there's going to be a big W weld around the whole section of the hull like so. As the name suggests, when you look at these two from head on, narrow cast hoods are going to be a little bit more pointed at the top, whereas wide cast hoods are going to be pretty beefy all the way up from the top to the bottom. Another key identification point here, narrow cast hoods are only employed on M4s and M4A2s, whereas wide cast hoods will only be seen on early M4A3s and M4A4s. Now at this point, you might be thinking, Hank, I'm looking at these Sherman photos and they've all got these big steel applique armor slabs in front of these hoods. I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Yep, we gotta get into that now. Around the summer of 43, it's determined that even with the DV ports removed, the driver's hoods on all existing Shermans are proving to be a significant weak point in the armor protection of the Sherman. At this point, the Sherman has seen nearly a full year of combat in North Africa with both the Brits and with the US, and US Ordnance has decided that until we can figure something else out, these hoods are going to need a little bit of assistance. Starting in the back half of 1943, close to 10,000 hatch guard protection kits are produced here in the States and applied to all new Shermans rolling off the factory floor, any Shermans that are undergoing repairs or factory refittings, and a bunch of these are going to be shipped overseas for addition in the field. These are literally just steel plates that are going to be tacked in front of these driver hoods to provide a little additional armor and some peace of mind, hopefully, for our two crewmen down in the hull there. You're going to see these across the board on pretty much any small hatch variant of the Sherman starting in 43 and continuing all the way through to the end of the war. So if you do see a photo of a Sherman with a hatch guard kit in Normandy or later, for example, you know this tank has seen a thing or two. Now, despite all this retrofitting and armoring going on with our vulnerable little small hatch Shermans, the real problem has yet to be addressed. These driver's hoods are still a weak spot. While this whole conversation is going on, another discussion is ongoing with the Army Medical Board regarding the small hatches themselves, the reason we've got these hoods in the first place. These small hatches, as you might guess, are too damn small! Sherman crewmen loaded up in all their gear are having a really hard time getting in and out of these hatches, especially during bailing operations when it is imperative to get out of the tank as quickly as you possibly can. Guys are getting stuck on things, they're getting hurt, they're ripping uniforms. The hatches are too small. So the medical folks say, hey, can we do something about this? We need bigger hatches. We're, we're hurting our guys. And this, combined with the vulnerability problems of the driver's hoods, will be enough to finally break the camel's back. Now, the reason for the driver's hoods in the very first place, as we learned, is due to that 56 degree angle on the front hull plate. There physically is not enough room inside the hull to fit the crewmen where they need to be. So to get rid of these hoods, the hull angle is reduced from 56 up to 47 degrees, as we discussed way back in episode one of Sherman School. This new reduced hull angling doesn't have the same effective armor sloping and thickness as before, but it does eliminate all of those weak points with the hoods and is deemed to be a worthy and overall beneficial change. And with this additional interior space, we can now finally give our hull crewmen a little more wiggle room. Starting in late 43, early 44, all production facilities are now going to start to switch towards this large hatch for the driver and the co-driver's position. This large hatch, as you can see, is quite a bit bigger than its predecessor. These now sit perpendicular to the body of the tank, drawing inspiration from the hull hatches utilized on the GMC M10. And these are what you're going to see go forward. Small hatch production in the States is going to cease completely, and focus will be placed on our updated variants. Starting in early 1944, all M4s will be produced as large hatch versions with the 105mm howitzer. M4A1 hulls will be redesigned again to feature this new large hatch, and pretty much all of these are going to be fitted with the T23 turret and the 76mm gun. About a thousand large hatch M4A2s will be built with the 75 through the spring of 44, and everything after that is going to also get the big 23 turret and the 76mm gun. The M4A3 becomes the most heavily produced variant of the Sherman Go Forward starting in early 44. About 10,000 large hatch M4A3s are going to roll off assembly lines through the spring of 45. About a third of these are going to get the 75mm gun, a third of these are going to get the new turret and the 76, and a third of them are going to be 105mm howitzers. And M4A4 production is going to cease entirely. No large hatch M4A4s are ever going to be built, and the last of the small hatch M4A4s are going to come off the Chrysler lines in the fall of 43. So timeline-wise, if you see a small hatch Sherman, you know that it was built before November of 43, large hatch sometime after that. And if you do see a small hatch with a DV port, you know that it was built way back before the fall of 42. So let's put this all together now. 
To recap, we've got two kinds of hull hatches, small hatch, large hatch. Small hatch is the oldest and will be on all production models of the Sherman through the fall of 1943. The very earliest versions will have a direct vision port. These will start to go away in the fall of 1942. All welded hull Shermans with small hatches necessitated the addition for driver's hoods. These will be either cast or welded. Narrow cast hoods are going to be seen on M4s and M4A2s. Wide cast hoods will be seen on early M4A3s and M4A4s. Starting in the middle of 1943, applique hatch guard kits start to be factory and field applied to all small hatch Shermans. If you see an image of a small hatch without applique plates, the photo was almost definitely taken sometime before the winter of 1943. Starting in the winter of 1943, all Sherman production will switch to the large hatch variety as hulls are reconfigured. Large hatch M4s rolling off the lines will all become howitzer models. Large hatch A1s and A2s are mostly all upturreted and upgunned variants. Large hatch A3s become the most prevalent 75mm version, but many are also upturreted and upgunned. And large hatch A4s are never produced, they're not a thing. So there you go. Lots of information, of course, but now you should have a decent understanding of the progression of Sherman hull hatches throughout this iconic vehicle's production run. Now, back in the beginning of the video, I mentioned, of course, that there are also another one or two hatches up in the turret of our old Sherman. But at this point, I've been babbling at you guys for way too long. So in our next Sherman School session, we're going to dive into the evolution of turret hatches over the years. Again, if you'd like to pick up one of my Sherman data sheet or Sherman spotter guide posters to follow along at home, you can do so using the link down in the shop or in the link in the description. And until next time, my friends, be well, happy building, cheers.